Okay, uh, we'll go. Are you okay to start? Yes, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, but at the moment, uh, I cannot yeah. share my screen. Um, um, Nancy maybe can stop for a moment. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Um, so, wait a moment. Can you see the slides? Yes. Huh? Okay. Shall I start or do we wait? Start? Yes, you can start. Yes. Ah, okay, good. Yes, hello, everybody. Good evening to India. Good afternoon to Europe. And uh, good morning to North America. My name is Wilko Reichwein from University of Hamburg. And I am delighted to be here today to introduce Dr. Nancy Gleason. Before uh, she's starting with a talk, uh, I would just like to give you some background information about Edu Reform Project and the reference to the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution is one of the largest transformation process in the world and a key disruptor um, that is changing how we live and work and what we need to learn. In a country as India, characterized by high labor density and underskilled labor force, the forced industrial revolution can lead to serious problems on the labor market. Around about 15 million jobs would be annually lost in the country due to automation. Education and skills development are key factors in the man or machine debate. Soft skills like critical, analytical and creative skills are particularly suitable for the labor market of the future. The aim of the Re Edu Reform Project is to promote consciousness and to empower Indian future and in-service secondary school teacher to mitigate the expected social impact of the fourth industrial revolution. The consideration of these soft skills is particularly important here. Now I will pass over to Dr. Nancy Gleason, direct director of the Hillary Balloon Center of, for Teaching and Learning and an Associate Professor of Practice in Political Science at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Um, her recent focus on the fourth industrial revolution's impact on higher education and the future of work. She considers social impacts of education, employment disruption, continuous reskilling and the role of industry in supporting upskilling of adults. She is the editor of Higher Education in the Era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And she is the co editor, Diversity and Inclusion in Global Higher Education Lessons from Across Asia. Today, she is going uh, to talk to us about the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the challenges for higher education. Welcome, Dr. Gleason. Wonderful, okay. thank you so much for that kind introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm del delighted to be joining all of you today around the world, whatever time zone you're in. I hope that this finds you um, safe from the ravages of COVID-19 um, and my condolences for anybody who is experiencing family loss or trauma from the pandemic. That being said, um, the pandemic is, is playing into um, other disruptions. And so I'll be talking about our education context. Uh, I do want to note that both of my books are open access. They're free and downloadable. So please take advantage of um, the emancipation of information through that process uh, and download any or all of the chapters that you find interesting. Um, there is a chapter in the diversity and inclusion book um, from Ashoka University on starting writing centers um, that may be particularly relevant to the Indian context. So I'm getting, talking to you today about the paradigm shift um, that Vilko has already mentioned. And then the 21st century skills that we're trying to foster um, in higher education. 
some communities and cultures and types of schools find it controversial to mention that the purpose of education may be employability, but for most of our learners, um, of course, their motivation is gainful employment. Um, so, so I put uh, for employability in, in italics or in parentheses. In the liberal arts context, which I teach within, the purpose of education is to live an examined life. But indeed, that liberal comes from the freedom of having that option. Um, not most people don't have that option. So I'll be talking about these distinctions as well. And the purpose here is to think about our learners and how we help them manage uh, this disrupted world we're in. And so I just want to re remind everybody that the, the, it's the students that this is about, although we're trying to address it from a systemic level um, because of the scale of the challenge. These are some of my students from this last semester. These three are from uh, Ukraine, Colombia, and Portugal. Uh, and they're struggling. They were so excited in this screenshot that they were able to get together even. Um, they, they've been on Zoom. Uh, their, their home villages and towns are being ravaged by the pandemic and the financial knock-on effects of that. Uh, and they're trying to learn. So in all of this, our pedagogies have to be trauma-informed. And our structures and our systems have to become much more flexible than they've been before. Um, and how we understand academic integrity um, has been challenged. And that remains a major challenge of the Zoom environment. So these are some of the things I'll be bringing up today. The diversity of our students and the diversity of our educators is shifting. Um, you know, across India, you could have uh, someone at symbiosis in Pune who's never been on an airplane before. Right, but flew down and has arrived at the school. You can have um, all kinds of different socioeconomic and religious mixes in the classroom that change how we engage our students. But the educators might not share that same diversity. Um, and then of course, we're becoming much more aware of the different neurodiversity of our students, dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, anxiety, um, and more visible impairments. Uh, um, in the United Arab Emirates, we call uh, people with different physical impairments, uh, people of determination, and how we engage them in the classroom. Also, as part of this shift that we have an opportunity to leverage um, to be more inclusive. And we're living in a disrupted world. So yes, of course, we have COVID-19, which is changing everything around us. But there were other changes afoot before this. Um, gender inequality continuing to be a major challenge. The demographics of our societies, whether or not we have youth bubbles, um, brain drain, a lot, growing elderly population, growing youth populations are changing how our schools function uh, and the enrollments and the pressure on the system. And of course we have the sustainable development goals, uh, the climate crisis influencing what people expect of higher education that we're somehow gonna be able to deliver solutions to all 17 goals um, is, is optimistic at best, but, but we have an obligation to also educate in this area. So how are we doing all of this? I'm gonna try and make some practical suggestions and put it in the context of the fourth industrial revolution today. And I should acknowledge, um, I have a very thick American accent and I speak quickly. So I hope you can all understand me, but for that reason, my slides are very wordy. There's a lot of content. So if you can't catch what I'm saying um, due to my accent, hopefully you can um, see it in the slides. Uh, in the context of India, of course, uh, currently being ravaged by the Delta variant uh, of the pandemic, we see some, some positive signs of perseverance uh, and some new trends emerging. So through COVID-19, the digital gender gap is, is, has been amplified. Um, only one third of women owning a mobile phone has influenced their access to education uh, relative to their male counterparts. Um, and the digital inequalities across India have, have meant that there's space for innovation in things like radio delivering education, which is one way, but it's still better than nothing. And so we see a resurgence of education through radio um, in, in some more rural communities uh, 
This has been hugely successful in Nepal, for example. Um, uh, but you need you need to have uh, solar powered radios distributed for that to work. Uh, but smartphones are are helping in the gender divide in in COVID nineteen, as studies from the World Economic Forum has recently uh, shown. And so I think as we we're still deep in the middle of this. When we emerge, whenever that is, I think probably two more years uh, from the pandemic uh, globally, we'll see, I think that the role of smartphones in education has become hugely important. But we have this fourth industrial revolution, which is rolling out unevenly across the world. And interestingly in India in particular, um, we had a, a brief introduction to what it is. Uh, I will elaborate on that here briefly. Essentially, it's made up of eight main technologies, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, also known as distributed ledger technology, drones, the internet of things, robotics, virtual reality, and 3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing. On their own, these are interesting technologies, but when you combine them, they are completely altering how we engage with each other and the planet. Um, when we have 5G network capability in our cell phones, um, these will all be amplified substantially. So, and same with soft haptics, uh, which is touch-based um, technological capabilities. Right now, we don't have much uh, access to soft haptics because we don't have the 5G network. But the bandwidth that's enabled by 5G networks will enable these other technologies to become um, much more of a daily way of life. Uh, and the bandwidth capability of your phone will be whether or not you're excluded from the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and we, we are ways off from quantum computing, but when we get there, it will change all of these technologies. It will amplify them in ways that our brains don't quite understand yet. Um, and that when it comes will be immediate, but we just don't know when it's gonna come. Um, I know this is a tiny infographic and you can't see it, but I wanna walk you through it. This is from McKinsey uh, and it's talking about where machines can automate human work already. And they took 54 countries, making up 78% of the global labor market to anticipate time spent on activities with the technical potential for automation. Um, and as we well know now, agriculture has hit the worst with 50% of the global workforce currently working in automatable jobs. Similarly in manufacturing, we're looking at 64% of the global workforce in manufacturing. Uh, and in India, we're looking at 52% of current employed people working in automatable tasks. Um, and globally, we are looking at 1.2 billion employees currently working in automatable jobs. And McKinsey anticipates this transition to be complete by 2050. This means we are in a global upskilling emergency. The shelf life of knowledge is substantially shorter than it's ever been before. Universities have to play a role in reskilling adults and creating new jobs, new types of industry. So one of the things I've been writing on late recently is the likelihood due to COVID-19 that we will all switch to a four day work week. Spain's already announced trials on this, Scotland and Wales have committed to it, uh, and it will slowly roll out through probably organized labor in some countries. But you work a 32 hour work week, you don't condense a 45 hour work week into four days. You work less and you double the jobs when you do that. This has to be subsidized by the government and taxes. For the first time ever, we have economic growth without job growth. So one of the ways governments can create jobs is mandate the four day work week. These are the kinds of schemes that governments and industry are gonna to have to agree to if we're going to have enough employability to maintain the social contracts we have where we pay taxes. We can do something different. We can have universal basic income, there's trials with that, but there's nothing else on the table at the scale of universal basic income that will help address this. Um, and so this is, these are the kinds of shifts we see coming. They are scale level. Um, and so the skills we need to thrive and the skills we need higher education to be delivering are changing very fast. 
And faculty don't change fast. Systems in higher education do not change fast. COVID-19 has forced it. And for all of the horrible things it's ravaging on our families and our communities, it has shaken up higher education in exciting, positive ways. The skills that employers are demanding now have deconstructed jobs into tasks. So as a professor, one of the main things I do today is grade. I verify knowledge by marking papers. I anticipate in 10 years, I will no longer grade. That will be automated. I will spend the majority of my time giving feedback based on the grade, which is what we should be doing. But most faculty members identify themselves as their biggest time consumption is grading. But that task will go away, it will be automated. It will be the feedback that's nuanced and individualized. And, and so thinking about what you do that consumes most of your time that you probably shouldn't be doing is what firms and governments are working on now. These are huge cultural shifts. They're not easy to roll out, but this is what firms are working on. Uh, many of you have seen these World Economic Forum schematics that show skills that are in demand trending up and down. Very controversial whether or not higher education should respond to such things and if it's responsible for doing so. But nonetheless, active learning and learning strategies is the number two most in-demand skill you can have. And we don't teach our students to talk about their learning strategies. We don't teach them to be self-directed learners, or we don't always articulate that. This is something we have to start doing in our classrooms, structurally in our schools. The K through 12 space does it, right? They'll have your small children come home and say, I'm an inquisitive learner or you know, I have courage. And they have these key buzzwords, but we don't do it in higher education and we need to start doing it. And we have to create these lifelong learners, something we're all talking about. Because the shelf life of knowledge is shorter, we need people to be lifelong learners. That comes with being self-directed, understanding your own learning strategies and understanding where you can get viable information from how knowledge is constructed, when it's fake or poor or manipulated data or unethical data, these kinds of things. But it comes down to five things, curiosity, initiative, independence, transfer, and reflection. As institutions, we can embed this in the entire curricular alignment of the school. This schematic I can see is it's cut off, I apologize, is from the American Association of Colleges and Universities and they've created 16 values rubrics. They're free, easy to download. They're difficult to download because they're behind a firewall, but you can download them for free one at a time. Uh, it just has a preview splash across it. Um, but these are sort of in the areas of skills for the fourth industrial revolution that are hard to measure. But I find these rubrics extremely useful for designing majors and programs within a university that have proper learning outcomes that align to program learning outcomes and institutional learning outcomes so that universities have that curricular alignment that adheres to your accreditation bodies, which are already using these. Um, so you're both in compliance with your quality assurance national schemes. And I know India has a brand new one that's Baroque um, uh, or complex. Um, but it, it no doubt includes these, these uh, key things. And the transfer one is very important for the gig economy, which is taking, I'll read it out loud because I know the text is tiny for you, makes explicit references to previous learning and applies it in innovative ways to, to knowledge and skills that demonstrate comprehension and performance in novel situations. So you may be... Um, working a hotel shift in the morning when hotels have a large demand at breakfast. At lunchtime, you're a substitute math teacher for two-year-old, for second graders. And at dinner, you're a violin instructor for kids after school. So you need to be able to transfer those three unique gigging skills uh, across each other. What can one make you better at the others? Or if you're a more of a, in a professional context, you may have a different job 18, every 18 months, a different employer, a different career trajectory. You may be in marketing and then sales and then dentistry and then nursing. 
So you need to know how to transfer skills over, over experience, and you need to articulate that to an employer. Um, similarly, we know we have to have global learning. Uh, and this, I know this is too tiny for you to see. I'll go to the next slide and, and elevate the criteria, but just to say that the American Association of Colleges and Universities global learning rubric is spectacular. It'll help you set goals for the university, for your staff, uh, and for your students on global self-awareness, perspective taking, cultural diversity, uh, personal and social responsibility, understanding global systems. And so this way, your students are better prepared for the disruptions of the fourth industrial revolution, where they, 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 they understand how to seek out um, solutions at the global and local level for the scale of our disruptions. Um, and they'll be able to address better the, the actionable nodes within the complexity of what we're facing. Um, so, you know, people can throw up their hands and be overwhelmed by climate change, but we know there's action individuals and communities can take. So being open-minded helps you say, what are they doing over there in this other mountainous country or other mountainous region um, where you, you become geographically aware that there may be a community far away dealing with the exact same problem. Um, and so this kind of uh, global-mindedness is very important something my personal country really struggles with, uh, the United States. Um, and for faculty building this, you know, at the faculty level, having your centers for teaching and learning or who's ever responsible for, for professional development of your faculty, it's also helping them establish local and global relationships, just exactly like edu reform is doing, us on this call here, um, sharing ideas across institutions, um, and then how do we navigate cultural and political differences in the classroom, in our curriculum, on our syllabi? How do we decenter the West um, and, and emphasize where we are and not teach school children Robert Frost talking about snow when they don't have snow where they live? Um, and the and very sort of we keep it in the context of the learner, but we go global. My students like to call it global. Um, so this is very important where we make sure we emphasize scholarship from where we are in the world, bring in guest speakers from where we are, not necessarily far away. I'm, I'm delighted to share with everybody the Abu Dhabi context, but I'm also American. Uh, and so how do we elevate our own local voices while, while, while we're doing this and sharing the global as well? Um, and so the, the task for higher education of adjusting it to these goals that are well mapped out, there's all these action items we can take, um, but we're also um, needing to scaffold this very, very specifically. So inside our institutions, we know Bloom's taxonomy of higher education. If you're an educator, you may have heard of it. Um, he was an American in the 1950s. Uh, who came up with this, and there's other schemes, SOLO is another one, but students will remember, then understand, then apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. This actually very well aligns with Confucian, Confucius's approach to education. And here in the Middle East, Al-Ghazali uh, or Ibn Sina would be um, people that probably Bloom stole this from. Um, um, and But he had this other dimension, which is the knowledge dimension. We may think of it in pedagogy as praxis, as experiential learning, but you remember a fact, you understand a concept, you apply through a procedure, and then you have to think about your own thinking. Lifelong learning is about this metacognition, and you need to have metacognition to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. You need to know when to use which methods in which context. You need to be able to reflect on your own biases because you're going to have to constantly unlearn how you understand the world works. When AI comes up to you and tells you you're thinking wrong, you need to be able to question your own consciousness. These are things humans aren't used to doing. Then there's all these ethical challenges we'll have. So as educators, 
we're probably going to be put in a situation where we have to have superhumans in separate classrooms. So humans with brain computer interface chips will not learn with humans without them most likely because they need zero information transfer and they need tons of time taught how to use that information. Will you let your children marry someone with a brain computer interface chip? Or will you let your children marry someone without one? These are kinds of weird ways in which we have to unlearn how we understand being human. So even as adults, we need to be hyper aware of our own metacognition, but we also need to prepare our learners for those bizarre ethical conundrums they're gonna be put in quite quickly, especially if they work in bioengineering already. This is one more schematic. I know there's a million schematics for the fourth industrial revolution, but this is one I really like. This is from the Institute for the Future. And this is what Singapore has based skills, skills Future Singapore on. And now just yesterday, for example, Philippines has announced their Skills Future schematic. The pointy circles are the drivers of disruption. So you have extreme longevity in some societies. So we'll live to about 140. Child rearing becomes something you do for a very short section of your life. Um, we live in a computational world, a super structured organizational world where corporations become educators. And in that case, you will go to work to be educated rather than get educated to go to work. So these are societal shifts in some societies that will roll out differently around the world based on your comfort level with losing your privacy. Now, India has the Adhar Act, of course, very controversial, but biometricing 1.3 billion people is an example of these superstructures. Um, they, they don't have to be industry-based, they can be governmental. Um, and they change how we're able to function. We go cashless, we confirm our education with our retina, um, our birth certificates are in our, are chipped in our arms, these kinds of things. And of course, um, more individualistic societies will be the last to conform to these. And, and more collectivist and centralized societies such as China will go first. Um, but this new media ecology is one I think, or ecology, depending on your pronunciation, um, is one where I think higher education plays a particularly important role, where we help students manage computational thinking and cognitive load management, right? You can't take in new information for more than four hours a day without being physically and emotionally exhausted. And what we do to our students, the way we've organized credit hours, they're taking information 70 hours, 80 hours a week. So teaching them how to manage that is, is something we have to do and we have to manage it ourselves as academics as well. Because the fourth industrial revolution is gonna make it so you're doing that all day, every day. In the workplace, you'll have corporate education that requires one day a week of learning and four days a week of applying that learning. So. These, these kinds of things mean that active learning, those learning strategies and your own metacognition become what the institution of higher education has to deliver. We need to do this in an inclusive way and um, learning about our students, asking them questions at the beginning. How much do they already know about the topic you teach? Where did they spend lockdown? How old are they? These are things we need to know about them um, and, and check with our admissions departments, share schematics of their, of their makeup, their socioeconomic background, their differences, and then signal our confidence. I don't care if you have 600 students or 15 students, you can signal confidence in them. You can do it on, on Zoom, you can do it hybrid, you can do it face-to-face. -face. So you look direct in the camera and you tell them you belong in this class. I know half of you have imposter syndrome, but you belong in this class many of our learners have never been told they belong in the classroom they're in. So just verbalizing that increases their ability to learn. Being extremely explicit with instructions matters so much more post COVID or during COVID or wherever we are, because students don't intuit the instructions, especially as the educators become more diverse vis-a-vis -vis their learners. Um, as youth mobility has shut down because of COVID-19, the diversity of the educator has increased vis-a-vis -vis the domestic makeup of the student. So I'm teaching 15 different countries of students. 
I, they don't understand, we don't have the same way to engage. So my instructions could be two or three pages long so that they know what the assignment is. Cause there's no common language about how to give a class presentation, how to engage in peer feedback, how to complete an exam. What is academic integrity? There's no common understanding of those things when you diversify the student body. So being explicit helps them achieve these goals of metacognition. Of course, we know good pedagogy is pursuing different teaching techniques, but that's hard when we're tired. It's hard when we're in a pandemic. It's hard when you have a thousand students enrolled in your course, um, but it's doable. Just change it up a little bit and tell them why, um, and you'll get great results. And then for yourself, reflect and learn on what's happening. Unfortunately, that probably means reading really inefficient uh, course evaluations, but it is a place to start. You can always use the poll function in Zoom to check in on them. Um, you can use Mentimeter is free. You can use um, Poll Everywhere is free under 50 students. So just take a pulse check from the class how many of them had lunch. I do that every day. My students, we have five minutes conversation about who's hungry and who isn't and why, and it makes a big difference. So that means you create high structure environments for them to get at these different types of learning goals that are not based on the content. Um, they're based on what they do with the content. Still need content, right? Now, curiosity rises in tandem with knowledge. If they have no content, there's nothing to do with it. So you still need to lecture now and again, that's great. Let them know that that is a moment for them to turn off their cameras and listen. Um, but then they need time to do something with that content. So just two examples of what you can do, whether you're an administrator or anything else, these are for small group discussion. So this might be a breakout room and you can do this with your staff, your faculty, if you run faculty meetings and you can do this with your learners, but a brainstorming session. And you can do this in a hybrid classroom with a Google doc. Uh, you can certainly do this face-to-face -face if you have a chalkboard or a whiteboard. Uh, and it works great for breakout rooms. Um, if you're in a hybrid situation where some students are at home and some students are face-to-face, -face, you can open Google Docs so that they work together. Um, and then you as the teacher can monitor the, the Google Classrooms, the, the Google Documents, um, and see what they're brainstorming. This will help you get responses from quieter students or students struggling with the language of instruction. It will help you see where their collective knowledge is at relative to what you're trying to get them to understand or know. And then you can help the students figure out how to categorize information, which is a key feature of understanding the content. So it's lower order thinking, but it lets you see a wide group of students or a small group in depth, and it lets them become the teacher. So in Paolo Ferreri's Pedagogy of the Pressed, one of the main things you can do is let them become the teacher. So hand it over to them and stop talking. So this is an example, but this brainstorm activity needs to have a lot of instructions because they don't know what they're supposed to do. Um, so that's what I mean by high structure. Similarly, have them create a mini mind map. They can do this in a Google doc, um, in the classroom, they can do it on a piece of paper with a pencil. Um, you'll always have that one student who has a whole set of markers with them, so they can use color. Um, but these mind maps are a great way for them to organize information, which is a key strategy for active learning and reflective learning, which helps with long-term memory. Um, so, and I highly recommend the book, Scientific Teaching. It's way overpriced, so lots of people have scanned it and put it on the internet illegally. So enjoy it, it's wonderful. Um, and if you are a academic developer yourself, if you run a center for teaching and learning, the last two chapters have um, suggestions for training faculty in this, in this type of pedagogy. Um, so I'm aware of the time and I've got too much, but just to remind yourself to get credit for what you're doing as an educator, document your efforts, write it down and uh, collect evidence if what you're doing is working, then use it for renewal, tenure, promotion, telling your boss or telling other people what good pedagogy you're doing is working. Share your expertise outside your classroom. And if it's not working, ask for help. 
Um, these are some, some advice to my own colleagues here at NYU. And then nothing I've said works if you don't get sleep yourself. If you don't practice your own self-care as an educator, you can't expect your students to be thriving. So your brain doesn't work when you don't get sleep. We know this neuroscience wise, it doesn't clean itself. I always ask my students to translate what we call in English when you feel foggy, what we say in English, but it translates in really interesting ways in other cultures. Uh, in Mandarin, there's three or four ways to describe that foggy feeling when you haven't slept, but it's literally that your brain has gunk in it. It didn't clean out while you were sleeping because you're there's no brain in your, in, there's no liquid in your brain, but there's sort of like a goo um, and what we know is when you're asleep, the vessels open up and that goo can move through. So when you don't sleep, it doesn't move through. Um, and this is a picture of a, on the ethics side of the brain computer interface. So these are some of the ethical challenges we'll have. We'll have to decide if we want them or we're gonna give them to our own children. Um, but, but our classrooms are about to change. Um, Neuralink has already got brain computer interface chips in pigs. We're moving quite quickly quickly into this um, being an eventuality for, for, for humans. And if it's not BCI, brain computer interface, it will be something else. Whereas educators, the disparity of what's coming and the access mean we are gonna have to be creative and we're gonna be given new ethical challenges in the classroom that we have to create policies around in advance. Um, and so if you are in a academic administration role, Maybe it's time to have an ethics committee. Um, I know we create committees all the time, but I think I think it is it is time to do that. Um, so I will stop there for Q and A, um, and you can follow me on Twitter and DM me if you have questions or on LinkedIn. And um, please do do download the books; they're free, so that we can all engage in these conversations and um, try to use my position at at really exciting institutions to elevate other voices. So. Um, anytime you want to join in on an edited volume, let me know. So I will stop sharing and pass it over to our colleagues who are helping us monitor this. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for this amazing lecture. We will move on now to our, uh, to our questions from the students. Um, Celia, you can start maybe with a question. Uh, yes, yes, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, Nancy, for the session. It was really insightful for us, um, especially taking into account the aim of the Edinburgh Fund project. I first would like to know if any of our partners present in the Zoom has a question for Dr. Gleason. Um, you can also write it down in the chat. Um, so otherwise, we have several questions from the students. Um, maybe I can start with a question from one of our students. Um, they want to know how can school teachers be empowered in the rural areas of India? This is an excellent question. So I think as a student, you can also help empower your educators. Um, and so tell them what you need. If, if it's okay to do so, if they could um, share their lectures on a podcast so there's, it's easier for you to stream in your home, it's less bandwidth, how can they increase access? If you're using paper, um, could they um, take screenshots of it and share it with you on WhatsApp so you don't have to print it out? So there's ways in which we can, can use technology to in, innovate um, without increasing the need for more bandwidth um, and expensive data plans. Um, but I really do think one of the things they could do is get a radio show. Um, they're very easy to set up and they can share free with anybody. You don't have to be enrolled in the school in that case. Um, and you can help them design those activities. So you can ask for an assignment where you create the assignment. Um, and then the educators can um, share that out, uh, use that again and again. So in my classes, I have my students become the teachers. Um, and so helping them learn that it's okay to be a facilitator and a coach instead of a lecturer um, and letting them know that you find that exciting in a respectful way um, is, is, is one of the things you can do. Definitely, I think in this digital world, students have a role to play also to help out their 
their educators. So we have another question. Um, there was a question, a student asking that all that you have explained to us today, how can these differ for private and for government teachers? Can we spot a difference? Yes, there is a difference. There is um, in part because of salary, but also in terms of pressure for corruption uh, in, in the, in the um, academic, in, in academic integrity space, the pressure to purchase grades um, is high. Um, and we see there's a difference based on the faculty salary in that space, not just in India globally. Um, and that's really hard to address. It's very hard to address, especially as the schools have pressure to take more and more students. Um, and so the private schools may have funding sources that enable them to keep the courses smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that affects the quality. Um, but um, the private schools also are more prone to corruption in the accreditation process. Um, and so they might not be delivering the quality that the public schools are delivering because the public schools are held to more rigorous um, accreditation and quality assurance checks than the private schools in some countries. Sure. Um, and so there, those are some of the differences. Actually, we have an, the next question that is related to what you just said. So it's from another attendee. He wonders how do structural changes in higher education create more diversity in countries where education is mainly <laughs> private? One, this create a bigger gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a wonderful professor named Taboha Moja, M-O-J-A, and she writes, up, she's South African, she writes about what she calls rhetorical equity, which is that we give a lot of lip service to equity, in the, but that the structures are so uh, inequitable. That, so she uses the metaphor, she says, trying to fix equity in South African education is like trying to unscramble an egg, um, which is sort of a sad sad realization, but the, the structures of apartheid have just been so brutally exclusive, exclusionary that it's difficult to undo. That being said, the structures are one of the ways in which we have to do this. And it's one of the exciting things about the fourth industrial revolution. We may be able to just leapfrog some of the negativity that the previous industrial revolutions embedded in the West um, mm -hmm. and just go right to a more equitable world. Uh, in, the, in, in access by creating structures, for example, where education is high quality and free through Zoom, right? Now we thought that MOOCs, for example, massive open online courses would um, um, democratize education or, or create it for everyone. But it turns out the reason why that hasn't really taken off is the people it's most useful to are the people who already know how to use it. And so the people who most need it need the infrastructure of an edu of a university or a high school to teach, the, to give them the rest of it, the campus life stuff, mm -hmm. the library, the, the counseling office, the writing center, the peer tutors, that's all absent from a MOOC. So we need something in between, especially for India, where the scale of the number of people, it's something like India needs something like 70,000 schools that hold 100,000 each to meet the demand of the people who will be college age by 2025. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be solved by brick and mortar. We need, we need structures that create new ways to access so, information. Um, actually, I, I had a question myself that is related to the topic. So um, uh, you mentioned the fact that currently we observe economic growth, but we do not see any job growth, which I find very interesting. But uh, under these circumstances, do you believe the main education of high, the main priority of higher education should be to be like an equalizing tool, or a common good, or you think it should be more oriented towards building skills to be fit for the labor market? Which side do you think should be prioritized? Yeah, this is a great question, and I. I, I teach a course called the future of education, and we were just discussing this an hour ago in my class. I don't personally, I don't think it's one size fits all. So, for example, in Uganda, they have managed to get a lot of students through higher education and there's no jobs. And that's just a tinderbox for revolution. It's really not um, or for, for 
for extreme so, um, social unrest. Um, so you have to create opportunities in different ways. You need to have through your accreditation system, a wide variety of types of education that's accredited, one year degrees, two year degrees, uh, special certificates and badges so that you can constantly reskill in a quality context. So Bologna framework only has three, the European framework for accreditation only has um, three levels. The United Arab Emirates has five levels. So these kinds of different opportunities gives people different types of education to go pursue that benefit the economy. So what's the purpose of education? There's lots of different purposes of education and I think that's okay. Um, um, you know, the liberal arts mm, is one thing but it's not scalable. Um, but it's, it's you know, designed to, to um, make you a lifelong learner, a creative thinker, problem solving. Not everybody needs to be that way, but everyone deserves the right to be curious, right? Um, and so your education system has to emancipate. And you know, the concept that curiosity is somehow deviant or dangerous, we're not away from that um, in a lot of societies. This is why Malala Youssef was shot in the face. Right, which we talk about. So you can't just emancipate everybody if it's not safe to be emancipated. Sorry, um, Dr. Jahav, I see you have your hand up. Uh, no, actually, when you're talking about the liberal arts, and in India, Savitri Bhakpuri Pune University, my university, we started liberal, liberal arts with the collaboration with Australian University. But uh, we have a big question in front of us when the student will become a graduate. Then uh, some parents were asking to us that what's about the employability? I know that we have a different kind of a development as a personality in a student. I but uh, when they asked about the employability after completion the graduation in the liberal arts, so how I can I can discuss with the parents? Yeah, this is a huge question. And I've been to your university. I've been to Pune. It's a wonderful city. Um, I spoke at Symbiosis a few years ago. Um, the parents have a right to be worried about this. The long run is liberal arts students globally make a substantially higher salary 15 years out. Um, but still, even, for example, in the United Emirates, we're the only liberal arts college, NYU Abu Dhabi is the only liberal arts college, and the employers come say, wait, you don't have a marketing major? We only hire marketing majors, so we don't want to hire your students. So we have a career development office that has to explain who our students are and what they do, um, and so we can evidence to the parents that we are collaborating with industry and business through our internship programs to show them the cognitive capabilities of our students. But indeed, when I worked in Singapore, I had an Indian student who said, you know, her grandmother said to her, you know, you used to be so good at math and now you're doing painting because she thought liberal arts meant painting. Um, and, you know, she was majoring in economics still just at a different type of school. Um, but also um, working with employers is, is, is something that universities didn't need to do. And now I think we should where, you know, they agree to take 10 graduates a year. Um, in, in exchange for us offering a specific type of class. And there's a lot of universities who don't want to collaborate with industry that way because they worry we'll outmode the skills quickly. Um, so you prepare them inappropriately. Um, but what Singapore is doing is really interesting. Now they're tiny and they have tons of money, so it's difficult to copy all of their um, amazing feats, but there is, um, they do really interesting things um, with employability that explaining to the parents the employability scheme so that you don't end up with half of your population being economists and no jobs for all the economists, right? Um, but also helping the parents understand the fourth industrial revolution a little bit. We don't need accountants anymore. They do quality assurance. All pattern-based work will be automated. Accountants do quality assurance and pattern-based work. Now, if you go to an association of accountants, they're very aware of this, and they talk about actually the fact is what they do is data analytics. So they have to retrain accountants to explain to themselves that they're actually very good at um, uh, quantif quantifying data. Um, 
but that's, we can't call them accountants anymore. An algorithm can already do it all. And radiologists, pattern-based work. We got rid of all the radiologists in like a three-year period. And they're very highly skilled. So you have to explain to radiologists that what they actually do is pattern-based work. And where else could they apply that? Architecture. Right? I, every time I talk to an architecture firm, I tell them, hire all the radiologists to design your hospitals. Um, so it's also about reskilling and thinking break, for educators, breaking it down into tasks and cognitive capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from Stefano. So the impact of the forum, the fourth industrial revolution on the labor market of developing countries is likely to increase the migration from the global south? Um, <laughs> Uh, I think climate change will do that before, before the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and, and, but also this means that the people who don't go are the ones with the least amount of agency, the ones who most need everybody else's help, the most vulnerable and the least responsible for both shifts. So there's a moral and ethical piece there as well. Um, COVID-19 has stopped all mobility. Um, the only people who are moving are the ones that absolutely have to. We saw that last week in Bangladesh before the lockdown or two days ago. Um, and so it's actually about how can we bring the education to them rather than forcing them to migrate. Um, but yes, absolutely. Uh, if temperatures keep doing what they're doing, we may unexpectedly get north to south migration, uh, which I don't think anyone's anticipating. But the, the most wealthy and able to move aren't going to live in Vancouver when it's 46 degrees Celsius um, or when it's negative 10 Celsius. Um, the, so, uh, but eventually, honestly, the whole planet's going to be that way. Moving isn't going to help you. Um, but in India, a great example of, of this kind of innovation is Dexterity Global. Uh, I recommend you all go Google it. It's a really interesting school. It's a one year uh, it's for high schoolers in India to get access to universities um, through full scholarships. So you visit the campus for two weeks and you're enrolled for life. And the school uh, and there's internships and amazing things. It's not a traditional higher education school, but it is uh, uh, um, innovating access. Uh, and their metrics of success is the amount of dollars of scholarships that their students receive. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of innovations where they're migrating, but then they're going to come back. Um, and they're enrolled in this school for life. Um, and the real trend in this space is ed tech. The largest ed tech firm in the world is GSV Ventures. And so they've backed Coursera, Bright Horizons, multi-billion dollar unicorns in ed tech space. And the, the, the CEO is Deborah Quazo, and she calls it K through life that the education space has totally innovated. That will change migration patterns. But I don't think it's gonna be the jobs, it's gonna be climate change. Um, I think there won't be as many jobs. And so we'll, most countries will have to go to some form of universal basic income. I'm not necessarily an advocate of it, I just think it's inevitable. And what's really interesting with COVID-19 is we set up the national mechanisms because most countries did payouts. So the channels are there, the numbers are there. You just have to turn it back on by taxing where the wealth is accumulating. And uh, uh, Bill Gates called, said tax the robots sort of famously about three years ago before COVID. That's what he meant. He just didn't say the, the big nasty word universal basic income because it changes the contract between in democracies. The money goes the other way. So the voting and the accountability of the state changes to its populace. Uh, but the United Arab Emirates already, sorry, I was going to say the U United Arab Emirates has already has a, a universal basic income for its citizens. Bah Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, they all distribute wealth from petroleum. In the United States, Alaska, every Alaskan citizen gets $1,000 from the petroleum industry a year. Don't you believe it's, it could be very difficult to establish a universal basic income in countries where even the tax system is very, uh, is very weak? 
Yes, yes. Um, and corruption of avoiding taxes is high. Um, and the other thing is many cultures define themselves by what they do, right? If, if, if you've got a daughter who's dating someone, you ask them or other, whatever, someone's got a new partner and they say, well, what did they do? What's their job? Right. That's mostly an individualistic society It's not collectivist societies. Usually they would ask, you know, what's their faith or whatever, what's their ethnicity, what's their tribe. Um, but where I grew up, it's um, what do they do? And so when you take that away, how are we going to define ourselves? Yes. Sorry, my son is standing here asking me if he can buy Gatorade. Um, so these are um, parts of the um, the ways and when when we when he uh, Lichko said at the beginning is changing how we live and work. It's also changing how we define ourselves as humans. What are we going to find to fill our days? Um, and you know, I, I remember entering a completely shut down mall in Dubai recently and everything was for sale 50% off. There's no one left to buy all the things. So capitalism has to change. It has to change. Um, and that changes the purpose of education. And many people have been saying capitalism has to change, but now the wealthy people are saying it too. Um, and this is uh, why COVID-19 demographics and the fourth industrial revolution are coming together at the same time, we can leverage that to solve the sustainable development goals, or we can slip further into um, what um, Sasson, who's a international relations expert calls the brutality of exclusion. Okay, I don't know if there's a partner that has uh, any other question. I've actually, uh, gone through all the YouTube questions from the students and other attendees. So if not, we I will give the floor to Vaibhav to, to conclude the session. Thank you, uh, Celia. Actually, really great evening in India because to uh, listen to Nancy, uh, because we heard a lot of about the fourth industry in violation. But today, really, how it works with the higher education and teacher education also. So it's a great uh, uh, privilege to have been to ask to propose a lot of thanks. Because, you know, uh, uh, we have a long series. Every Friday we met and we had a discussion about different kind of tools and regarding this uh, project. But now I realize that it is a big responsibility to uh, as a teacher uh, in higher education, even in uh, teacher education, that how I incorporate all the 21st century skills among my learners. Because I, I want to nurture this philosophy and principles about these uh, skills. And this uh, session will be definitely helpful to all of us. When I, I think all of us and all those uh, uh, listeners from YouTube, they have a lot of questions, they have a lot of curiosity, and definitely they will read more and more about this uh, fourth industry violation and connection with the higher education. Because uh, in India, you know, you already mentioned about uh, the uh, users, yeah, it means, uh, how the user of their devices in in comparison with the world, India is then the second on the rank. I think we are also in the second to using the social media and different small devices, for example, mobile and laptop and number of devices. India is also second in the world. So our young generation is quite uh, friendly with the devices, but how, how as a teacher, I will be used this kind of revelation for the teaching and learning. So really I am on the behalf of entire education, edu reform team and all the partners of the edu reform teams. I'm really thank, heartfelt thanks to you. We have a like Namaskar, we have a very thank you, Shukriya, because uh, I hope uh, all my learners will definitely utilize and all all the partners we are utilizing this session to making this project more clear and more fruitful. 
again i would like to thank to all of you i thanks to giving this opportunity to uh, alda and celia because it is my responsibility but they are they assign this uh, task to us thank you to alda and celia thank you uh, dr sangeeta and dr kolil because because of them we become partner of this things thank you to all the partners thank you to all the listeners those are uh, from uh, youtube all my students i need to thank because they raised number of questions and celia also so uh, Uh, fetching this question to the Nancy, so I thank you, Celia. Also, thank you to one and all. Thank you very much, Celia. Yeah. Thank uh, you, everyone. Thank you, Vibha. Thank you, Dr. Gleason, and well, we'll keep you informed for our next events. And thank you again for this lecture. It it was uh, great for us. <laughs> great. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.